Hey, hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? I hope you're good, I am great. Fern Friday's back. Just for a few weeks anyways. I'll address that in the vlog that comes out after this video. But to get things kicking off though, let's talk about the macho fern. The macho fern right back here in that background next to the fountain, Nephrolepis bifurata macho. Nephrolepis, common plant family for the ferns, like the Boston, the Kimberly, commonly called sword ferns, lots of variation within there. The macho fern is hardy zones nine and up. They can take a little bit more sun than some of the other ferns can. Climate variables, of course, are a factor. They're also slightly more drought tolerant and just pretty. And they get big. These are a big fern. They live up to their name. Like I mentioned, the macho ferns can take a little bit more sun than some of the other ferns can. At least that's been my experience, but they're still listed and probably will do best like just to be safe from shade to part shade. I have mine where they're getting part sun. It does get filtered in the afternoon from all the pine trees and things above, but it gets pretty toasty over here. Pretty bright and intense and they're doing okay. The caladium's not an indicator. I just set that there just now because I just finished filming that video. That's not normally where that goes. Indoors, bright, bright, bright light. As much as you can give it, they will do just fine with that. If it's in like an atrium, solarium, someplace that's warm and the light has a lot of reflection, or I guess I should say it's more intensified, magnified through the glass than maybe not as much. Could scorch them a little bit. Watch out for photo oxidation, bleaching on the foliage. If that happens, then just move them to a spot where they're not getting as much light. The beauty of the macho fern though is that they don't have to have that. These are a really sturdy fern. As a house plant, they're going to be, I would say, not exactly difficult, but well, they get big. Macho ferns get gigantic. They can get up to six feet tall. Those fronds will get about six feet tall. They start to spill over. It's very graceful, very beautiful, but like that can be a bit much for in the house, right? I guess that depends on your house. I typically like to place my macho fern someplace where I can see the falling foliage, the foliage as it starts to trail down. I like that to be evident. I want it to stand out, which makes macho ferns excellent for hanging baskets, though you need to hang them from something pretty sturdy because they get big, or urn planters, just tall planters, something where that shape is going to come over and drape down. They look so pretty that way. It's almost kind of like, you know, a Canary Island date palm, how they kind of look like fireworks. They come out and they do this. Y you know what I'm saying. They have a nice shape, a nice habit. And no surprise, they are a typical fern, meaning that they like a consistently moist, organically rich, well, organically rich, organically rich, well-drained soil. During the warmer parts of the year, when I have macho ferns outside, I fertilize them monthly. Typically, I just use a seaweed fertilizer for these. I also amend their potting mix with something nice, rich, and organic that'll help produce a lot of good things going on in the soil, like Espoma Biotone, Plant Tone, the Trifecta from MI Gardener would be fantastic, you know what I'm talking about. Something to help liven things up a little bit. In the winter months when it's indoors, I do not water them very often at all, and I don't fertilize them pretty much at all. If you fertilize these when they're just chilling, when they're inside not getting as much sunlight, then you can end up having really lanky, stretched out growth because it's getting the nutrient in the soil to grow, telling it, hey, keep on growing even though the lighting and the temperatures aren't really adding up to that. So I just don't. But if I were growing this inside during spring, summer, early fall, when there's more light out, temperatures are a smidge warmer in the house potentially, then I would still fertilize it monthly. You can use an all purpose. Sometimes it's best to dilute that by 50%. Keep an eye on the foliage after you fertilize. Make sure there's no scorching or anything. That if there's too much nitrogen, sometimes that can be an issue. If you're concerned about that, you can just dilute the fertilizer like 50%. Continuous release, also a great idea. I reapply monthly, even though the packaging usually says that it lasts for like six months. I find that that's typically not true. Not true at all. Monthly seems to be best. That's partially because of how those things are packaged. They're not really packaged and stored in a way to keep those continuous release fertilizers at their optimal conditions. I like the Jax or the J.R. Peters, the Jax Classic Coat. Good fertilizer, Osmocote, fine. You know, just whatever works for you. Like I mentioned, with the liquids, I pretty much stick with the seaweed fertilizer. They really seem to enjoy that. And again, amend the soil with nice, rich things, things that are gonna liven it up. And that's the same thing for if you're planting these outside as a perennial. Now, these are going to be something that will grow very aggressively. So be careful planting them someplace where they could spread and take over, because they will, they will spread and take over. They have tiny little rhizomes that spread under the ground and you can dig them up and lift them and 
either replant them, toss them, whatever you feel like doing with them. It's really easy to miss some of those tiny little roots and new plants will just keep growing. On that note, pretty easy to propagate. When they fill out their pots too much, if it gets to a point where you're watering them, they're not staying hydrated, or you're seeing roots coming out the tops or the bottoms, if both, of course, that's also a thing. That's when it's time to go ahead and bump them up into a larger pot, something that's at least one to two inches larger on the outside diameter of the pot, or go ahead and divide them up. Clean knife, you can cut the plant in half, cut it again, make it into quarters, set it into four different pots, you have four new plants. This is best done during the late spring to early summer, because that's when they're starting to wake up and start going again, so it's when the roots are going to kind of take the trimming a little bit better. When necessary, I have divided mine up in the late summer before moving them in. It's not ideal, but there have been occasions where I'm like, man, this plant grew so, so, so much. When I take this inside, I'm gonna have a hard time keeping it hydrated. Even though they are fairly drought tolerant as far as ferns are concerned, I wouldn't call them by any means a drought tolerant plant, but is like in comparison to a Boston fern, Kimberly Queen fern, those other common ferns that are sold at like the big box stores, I don't have to water these anywhere near as often as I do those ferns. And they're not as messy either. The Boston ferns and the Kimberly Queen ferns, when those dry out inside, if the pot's too small, if the humidity's too low, then all the pennae, those are what we'd call like leaves, leaflets, that's the pennae on a fern, those will fall. And they just, they make a big mess. The macho fern doesn't do that as much. It's not something I have problems with. But lower foliage will brown out and die naturally as the plant grows. That's not that big of a deal. Just trim that right out. Keep the plant clean, trim out dead foliage, anything like the browning fronds, yellowing fronds. Just keeping it nice and tidy helps prevent pests and diseases. Not having dying dead foliage in there makes the plant less attractive to problems. If you do notice that the fronds have a brown outline to them, or really the pennae has a brown outline to them, that can mean the humidity is too low. Maybe they're in a spot where there's a lot of airflow and that's drying things out. That can be an issue sometimes. Misting the foliage can be somewhat effective with raising the humidity around the plant, or you can put a large pebble tray underneath it with some water in it. Make sure that the bottom of the pot's not in contact with the water though. Keep them in a bathroom near a fish tank. You know the drill from Fern Fridays, right? Do what you have to do to bring the humidity up. It, honestly, one of the easiest things to do with humidity is to keep plants grouped together because those help retain and redistribute the moisture through transpiration or just get a humidifier. Just a small little humidifier can make a pretty big difference. Again though, not typically as much of a problem with the macho ferns. Every climate's different though. My winters are fairly dry, but not horribly dry. So it's just gonna depend on kind of where you live. As I mentioned, reduce watering during the winter months. I water mine when the top inch to two inches of soil is dry, which isn't something like you do with all ferns. Ferns like the maidenhair and like the cotton candy fern and things that are more delicate and dainty, you let them dry out, it's no good. These guys, they can dry out a little bit. They don't usually throw too much of a fit over it. As far as toxicity is concerned, well, when I look up toxicity for the macho ferns, I'm not getting good results. Everything that's coming up is about the asparagus fern for some reason, even though I type in macho fern. Asparagus ferns are toxic. The macho fern is a nephrolepes. The nephrolepes typically, like the Boston Kimberly Queen, there's many, many, many of them are not normally toxic to like dogs, cats, children. But since I can't find anything that says for certain, I'm not gonna comment on it. I'm gonna say, keep it away from your pets and babies and humans, anyone with a curious mouth, keep it away from them. Of course, comment down below. Let me know what you find out about the plant tips, tricks to growing them, common problems you've had indoors, spider mites can be an issue, mealybug, scale. They, scale does seem to kind of appreciate the foliage on these ferns quite a bit. The spider mites having higher humidity and good airflow is a really good way to just prevent that. With any of the house plants, I always say if pests become a problem, to take it to a shower, take it to the sink, flush the plant out as much as possible. You can use neem, insecticidal soap, whatever works for you. Give that a shot, just read directions, be very careful with chemicals. That's kind of why I like to start with neem. It's technically not a chemical or um, a diluted soap. Peppermint oil is fantastic, especially if you have cats. Peppermint oil, it, when I dilute that, I probably do like, I don't know, maybe a tablespoon to a bottle of water. That's not helpful. I don't know what size my water bottle is, but I shake that up, distribute it really well. The main thing is that I want the dilution rate to be high enough that the smell is really intense. That coats the bugs, helps kill them off, and it keeps the cats away. That heavy menthol smell, they don't like it. I find it refreshing, even though it does kind of burn the eyes a little bit. That's gonna do it, another Fern Friday. It's fun to be talking ferns again. Like I said, comment down below with any tips or tricks you have, corrections of course. Get a conversation going, let's talk about the plant. 
I may end up repotting my macho ferns into hanging baskets. I haven't decided yet. They are a little bit too big for this spot though, because as they grow, they're blocking the light and the water from everything behind them. So I'm going to have to move them, but for right now, oh, they look so pretty right here. I'll have updates on that on my social media, which is linked down below. I use Instagram far more than anything else, and also in like future garden tours, see things like that. Don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up, helps the channel, it helps the videos a lot. I really do appreciate it. So thank you so much for doing so. And subscribe as well, and hit that notification bell because I upload multiple times a week and that way you know when new videos come out. All right, everybody, that's gonna do it. Hope you're having a great day, great life. Everything's just going beautifully for you. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.